All right, everybody. Uh, you know, I'm usually b before people's alcohol or between them and their alcohol, and now I'm during the alcohol. So uh, luckily, I was smart enough to be proactive and uh, get my own so I can in self indulge. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, so I'm Aaron Reinhardt. I'm the CTO and founder of, uh, co-founder of Verica.io. Um, I'll, I'll give more background on what that is and what I, who I am. Um, so today I'm gonna give a talk called Security Differently. If anybody out there is a safety engineering uh, nerd uh, or, <laughs> or um, uh, you know, you recognize that uh, some of this comes from actually Sydney Decker's Safety Differently. Uh, and part of part of that is to illustrate the the um, the power of a the, the, the domain of safety engineering and what that could mean for security uh, if, if applied. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about security differently. So a little bit about me, who I am. Um, like I said, I'm the CTO and founder of a company called Verica. We are the people that created Chaos Engineering. My co-founder is Casey Rosenthal. He created Chaos Engineering at Netflix. I am most notably known for uh, applying, uh, being, being the first to apply chaos engineering to security. I wrote the first open source tool in the space called Chaos Slinger. And I'll talk a little bit about that, um, as well as uh, I was the former, before I started Verica, I was the former chief security architect of United Health Group. Um, my job there was the engineering strategy for the company. Uh, I also led the DevOps and open source transformation of the company. Uh, my background extends from the government, uh, working the DOD. I worked actually, I worked in resilience engineering uh, or reliability engineering actually uh, at NASA uh, for a number of years. So it's kind of not that it kind of makes sense where you get where you're going in your career sometimes. Uh, but um, I'm also a freaking author, uh, uh, I'm the, uh, author of the O'Reilly chapter on chaos engineering in the coming O'Reilly book coming out in the spring. I'm also currently writing the Security Chaos Engineering O'Reilly book with Kelly Shortridge. Um, so yeah, I'll talk a little bit about chaos engineering in my presentation today as well. So why security differently? Okay, um, I want to talk about uh, partly the reason why is I want to talk about the the lessons I've been learning from applying safety engineering to security, uh, and I'm going to talk. I'm going to show you a, little, a few things about um, where safety differently and safety two. Uh, come from, um, as well as we're going to talk about resilience engineering and chaos engineering. Uh, so safety and security actually have a lot in common. Uh, and it's almost funny, you can actually just almost replace safety for security, the words, and it makes complete sense. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, so safety differently, like I said, comes from Cindy Decker. Um, he is one of the world's foremost authorities on um, uh, airline accident investigations. Um, over 30 years of research, he's been he's been he's wrote several books called "Drift into Failure." Probably he's written, um, you know, uh, basically on how to really uh, properly do an investigation and drive value from um, uh, accidents and, and uh, particularly the airline industry that, in, that end in human error, human factors. Um, so he likes to say that uh, safety differently is about relying on people's expertise, insights, and the dignity of work as actually done to improve safety and efficiency. It's about halting or pushing back on the ever-expanding bureaucratization of the compliance of work. Um, so security differently is about relying on people's expertise, uh, insights, and the dignity of work as actually done to improve security and efficiency. It's, I'm not gonna to just read from the slide, but I want you to just kind of to show like, uh, um, uh, the, the power of a lot of the work done in safety applies directly to security. And so, Sidney uh, Decker in, uh, in Safety Differently likes to talk about how there's security currently, or safety currently, uh, and security differently. Uh, and um, so how we do security today is people, we, t we tend to point the finger at humans. Those damn humans, right? Like they're the, the source of our problems, they click on emails, they make mistakes, they cause breaches, right? Um, it's about, uh, a safe security currently is about telling people what to do versus asking what they need. Uh, where security differently, I didn't explain that side. Um, security differently is about how people are actually the solution, uh, not the problem. Uh, security currently is about control and compliance. Uh, you should do this, you have to do this, um, versus uh, focusing on competency and common sense. Um, as well as security currently, it focuses on the absence of negative events 
uh, count, the counting of the absence of negative events. So like the number of alerts, the number of warnings uh, versus the presence of positives, things that humans do to create resilience. So the fact is, no system, this is another Decker quote that I have manipulated. Uh, no system is secure on its own. It requires humans to create it. Safety, quality, security, reliability, resilience. They're, they're manifestations of a human creation, right? Humans have to create it. It does not exist without a human. So to say that humans are directly the problem is kind of a direct contradiction. So security currently, um, are we doing the things that really matter, right? Are, are the activities, so there's a whole conversation. I think John Wickett, uh, John, not John Wickett, John Willis called me out earlier today on, on the whole objective versus subjective um, types of activities. Uh, one of the things that when I was at United Health Group, that's what I was really trying to, really frustrated me is that a lot of things that we were doing in security are very subjective in nature. What I needed, what I needed was something more that I could count on uh, that I, um, instead of uh, having to ascertain whether or not it was um, um, really a thing or not. Um, and I can expand on that in a minute. Um, but what is the best measurement of security performance? How much are we learning from our past performance? And how do we know when we're doing well? I mean, we have to do so many things well in security, but, how, but what do you actually do well? And how do you know it? Um, and that's an important aspect of where I'm going with things. So outcomes are essentially the ultimate measure of effectiveness. But these outcomes don't seem to be getting any better. I don't, I, 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 uh, like, it seems like the breaches and outages, and, and our outages can be just as bad as breaches from a cost perspective. We love insecurity to think that the breaches are, are, um, are the, the sole, um, you know, the, the sole worst thing that can happen, but a lot of times outages tend to happen a lot more frequently than, than breaches do, and they're just as expensive. One minute of downtime, when I was at United Health Group during open enrollment, one minute of downtime was over a million dollars. They get very expensive uh, during an hour, an hour outage. Um, so why is it that outages and breaches seem to be happening more often? Well, it's partly my belief that we have a flawed understanding of how our systems actually function. And let me explain why. Uh, is that um, uh, we are in the era of what they call um, uh, complex adaptive systems. Anyone familiar with what a complex adaptive system is? Okay, so a complex adaptive system, I'm gonna go through the traits of that here in a minute, but it's actually a term in applied physics, so I'm gonna explain what I mean. It's not a system that is complicated or complex that always changes, it's actually a term that has traits from applied physics. But I, I, it's best understood by actually talking about how, uh, or reminding uh, ourselves that system engineering is really a messy affair. Uh, as humans, we don't tend to remember that because of our need to abstract and simplify uh, for, to process things in our brains. Okay, so um, the genesis is our systems have uh, become more complex and messy than we remember them. So in the beginning, uh, as an architect, I, I used to, uh, as the chief security architect, I used to have data architects and solutions architects for the same system come to me with different diagrams, right? What does that mean? That what that means is that that is their mental model, or their, or the context by which they understand the system. Um, and, um, but I love it, I love diag that's how real diagrams are, they're a mental model of a system. But, but in the beginning when we're designing a system, we love to think that we are, our plans are very simple, that it's this simple, right? That you have a three-step process, we've got the code, we've got the standard image, we've got, we've got prod and staging, and, and then we've got these beautiful 3D, nice diagram representations of our environment that we tend to build. It's probably actually already built. Um, but we love to think th things are this simple. In reality, it's probably never ever looks, our system never looks like this. Um, our systems actually slowly grow beyond our, our ability to understand what they're, what they're doing. And how does that happen? So what happens is after day zero, maybe the system looked like that diagram before, but after about seven or eight days or a few months, you know, uh, marketing comes down and says, we got the pricing model wrong. You need to refactor the pricing. So you gotta go refactor. Uh, the day after that, you have, a, have an outage on the payments API and you have to hard code a token. Uh, of course, you go back and fix that later, right? Um, your system slowly grows, um, you know, or, or yeah, Google hires your lead engineer and you have to swap out engineers midway through building things. You know, what happens is that um, this, our, our system slowly drift into a state of unknown. And a couple of this with the sheer complexity of how we're building software today. Typically, I usually go deeper into this with my security chaos talks about complex adaptive systems and how we're building things. But if you think about it, if you're uh, like, 
With microservices, public cloud computing, and continuous delivery, we've never built systems that were so large, that were so disparate how they operate and change so often, that it's, it's, it's when you have three or 400 microservices out the gate, that's very difficult for a human to mentally model the behavior, especially when things are spinning up, spinning down, auto scaling. You know, you're running old versions, you're running new versions. Each each microservice you have has a different team. Each team has to, you know, be aware of if each team is delivering ten times a day. How is everybody keeping track of what everybody's doing? Um, these problems are starting to manifest into uh, when it comes to post post deployment. That's really where chaos engineering becomes really valuable. But so you get the idea. After years, it just kind of magnifies. Um, uh, over time. That's how you get, um, uh, and this is my belief of how the simplest things um, it keep causing breaches and it's not the complicated attack chains and, and very complicated, it, it's, it's really kind of dumb stuff, accidents and mistakes that are leading to a lot of, um, a lot of what's causing uh, the problems in the business. Um, so complex systems are a challenging thing. So. What I mean by that, so examples, oh, so let me do this one actually. So examples of complex adaptive systems. So examples of complex adaptive systems would be like the human body, uh, bird patterns, global financial markets, nation state political interactions, Donald Trump's tweets. Um, yeah, I mean, think about it, it can be. So let's say Donald Trump says something negative about Japan, right? Like in a tweet, like he's, a, you know, that's Donald, right? I mean, you know, that's our president. Uh, <laughs> but, he, uh, but, but, but people seeing that tweet may start acting, reacting to that statement. They might start making changes. And then um, you know, other, other countries or other par interested parties might start acting, reacting to those changes. What happens is the outcomes are no longer linear. They become compounded. It become, uh, the ripple effect starts, starts to magnify uh, the outcomes non-linearly. Non right? Instead of 1 plus 1 equaling 2, now it equals something like negative 5,000. It's because of the acting and reacting throughout the system. It's very similar. That's the, that's the problem we have with the human body, with drugs and medication, is that it's very difficult to, because all the systems are interrelated and depend upon each other, when you make a change, it ripples throughout the system. Like you take a, a pill to, to, to help you with your cough and your foot starts hurting, right? It's because the systems are interrelated and your impact, you're causing a nonlinear outcome. Um, so the point I want to bring this up and why I bring up complex adaptive systems is this is what we're building today. I mean, like we are building systems that, that, uh, that demonstrate these fo the following traits. Cascading failures become, start to become a problem in, in complex adaptive systems. Uh, like I said before, the relationships are nonlinear. Um, and it's impossible, or, or a diff I, I said difficult, but it's actually impossible to model. It meant a, a, um, a complex adaptive system. Actually, the only way you can actually understand uh, the behavior of a complex adaptive system is to interact with it. Um, and I'll expand on that in a little bit. Um, so the fact, outages and breaches will continue to get worse. It's be par partly because of this problem. And you can actually make the argument, I mean, who here has ever actually seen a line of code execute in memory? I mean, like, it's, this is not a question uh, for your technical competency. It, it's to, to really make you think about how well you really understand the systems that you build and run. Um, and, what I'm, and, and I guess where I would expand on that is like, is that with this new era of size, scale, complexity, and speed, uh, if we already don't have a, a good understanding of how our systems function, uh, it's, it's only going to continue to get worse. So we need new ways to instrument uh, and, and, and increase our observability and understanding of our systems. So it's about really thinking differently about the problem set. So the things we've been doing in the past does not mean those are going to be things that we need to be doing in the future. So software, uh, it's kind of a new splash, but software's kind of taking over everything. I mean, this is the new OSI stack. I'm sure you guys have saw this in the CISSP, right? Right, I mean, I actually stole this from James Wickett, so I love that one. No, but I mean, that software is software and the internet, I mean, are taking over everything, and we're, uh, as society, society's become so dependent on it. So we have a responsibility as engineers, you know, to ensure the, um, you know, that we're building safe, uh, safe software. Um, so my areas of potential improvement. So architecture versus architecting. So I used to, you know, I, I, I'm a trained architect in Tolgaf and Sapsa, Sapsa, Jericho, right? Like I've never actually successfully implemented any of that. <laughs> Um, you know, like as a, so I've been trained enterprise architect and solution architect, uh, and you know, um, I like to call myself more of an archineer, uh, because well, the reason is is that uh, I believe it's it's it, you're a better architect of, uh, when you understand uh, have a better understanding of the actual engineering being done. Um, 
But architecture is in deep need of disruption as a discipline. Um, but um, yeah, I'm going to spin on that in a second here. Um, so Dave Snowden, he's an expert uh, in sort of complex adaptive systems. You'll see it. You can Google him. He talks a lot about similar stuff on the complex uh, system space. But he likes to say the scaffolding, meaning architecture, is never intended to be permanent. right? And um, the architecture is still needed. It's just we're gonna, we need to rethink how we're doing things. Um, so architectural patterns. Um, does anyone here know what I mean by architectural patterns? Is anyone here not will just want to does, doesn't want to raise their hand at this point? Okay, <laughs> got it. Okay, all right. It's cool. It's the end of the day. We're drinking. Um, but um, I've actually I actually spent a lot of time, effort, and money at United Health Group on architectural patterns. The problem was is nobody used them, and I wasted a lot of uh, deep engineering talent on getting them to work. It's hard to keep them up to date. It's hard to keep them effective. You know what the patterns are there to sort of architect a direction in a in a vehicle by which uh, you know, especially from a security perspective, a lot of people want to know how do I build this securely in X. Well, the pattern is there to show you how the company is approved to build them and align to technologies companies company has in its portfolio. Um, but um, I have rarely ran into any architect uh, that has actually got patterns actually be an effective thing. But what I'm talking about here is like when you start, some things aren't working. We need to just we need to start reinventing them or, or removing them. We're already being asked to do lots of things in security, but we need to focus on what's really having an impact in, in the positive outcome. So threat intel. I don't mean threat intel is a bad thing, but what I do want to say about it is all the intel feeds in the world won't matter much uh, if you don't have your house in order. Right, you can focus all day on what somebody else is doing, but uh, if you're not, if you don't know uh, how secure your own house is, that's probably a better place to focus on. It's you have, you have the ability to control that. Um, deception techniques, really, uh, I have found in my career, it really just equates more tax service management. Uh, but I believe deception techniques, we're, we're entering an era where they're actually going to be the future and, and the most, of, uh, most effective means of, of combating an attacker. So what do I mean by this? Like, so if you don't know how clean and how, how, how secure your actual, or how functional your actual security is, uh, if you don't have an objective means of measuring that, um, what is, I mean, all you're really doing with a honeypot or similar type of deception techniques is, you're adding more things to manage, right? More like, um, yes, you might be able to catch something low level, but like you are, are, are maybe a potential threat actor, but like, um, but like uh, what really matters is how secure your actual system is. Um, so uh, another thing is, uh, I, it's funny is I do a lot of research, especially for the rally book on resilience engineering and like, you know, um, I bring this up. AI, ML, DL, RL, so uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, rational learning, and quantum entanglement. So that's the next, that's going to be the next big buzzword in security is quantum this and quantum that. And like uh, Einstein never could fundamentally wrap his mind around quantum entanglement. <coughs> no one really has since. So uh, if we don't fully understand it, I don't understand how we're really applying it effectively. But we can go ahead and say it all day. What I'm trying to say here is that like no amount of sexy new technology is just going to magically solve your problems. It's funny, as part of the research that I've been doing is like uh, a lot of the best system engineering papers came out in the 1980s. And you read, I, I love reading the papers like uh, in No Silver Bullet, which is about the nature of complexity in software. Uh, they talk about like, they talk about the complexity of essential complexity and accidental complexity. But towards the end, they're like, I don't know, AI might solve this. You know? <laughs> but it's like, that was like uh, 30, 40 years ago. Um, you know, it might solve it, you know. Um, so are you kidding me? <laughs> well, um, AI did, still does not exist. No, no AI has actually successfully passed. We keep calling it machine learning, rational learning, deep learning, AI. It's not true. It's, we need to stop it. It'll give the engineering time to mature and grow and be successful. Uh, and it, and um, it's just really annoying to hear it all the time. Uh, so security policies. So I, I actually, I, let's see, do I have it here? Um, so this is an area that I really tried to um, I did do some disruption at United Health Group uh, when I was there. I would go around and act to talk to the people in security, and I would have them read a part of the security policies and ask them if they could tell me what I was supposed to do with that, right? And uh, I, it was almost a zero. I, 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 don't, I got next to no good answers. But like the point of I did this was I was trying to highlight uh, and reflect on the fact that if we don't understand, the, if the security person doesn't understand or cannot explain what you're supposed to do with the policy, how on earth is an engineer supposed to make sense of that and be compliant? Um, so we need to rethink on how, how we're doing security policies. Uh, and um, 
There's some really innovative ways a lot of people are working with and dividing, you know, writing their own security libraries and code and directly providing uh, an engineering team the actual components by which to be compliant uh, and contributing to the value chain instead of just pointing fingers. Um, and um, it's really great for breaking down um, value. Um, so risk management. I have a heavy, huge issue with this. Um, so uh, I, I, we, we still need to manage and measure risk, but the way we, we what we've done, uh, you know, how we've come up with the, uh, the management. There's actually a great book out there called. Uh, uh, anybody ever read the book um, How to Measure Anything in Cybersecurity by Douglas Hubbard? Right. He also wrote a book called The Failure of Risk Management. It's a great book, uh, but it really doesn't address some of the things I'm about ready to say. What I'm about to say is like, is uh, how we approach risk management is not designed well or is not well equipped for a software defined world. The nature and speed of which software changes, by the time you identify a risk like, and you work it through a risk management chain, um, or by the time it gets uh, subjectively and arbitrarily assigned a high, medium or low by some analyst, and gets, uh, let's say it gets a high and it goes in a sizzle for the Friday, the Friday risk register meeting, uh, and it, the CISO is gonna make a decision about a system that has no fundamental context on how it operates, works, or, or how the risk may actually be a risk or not. Um, and, uh, but the nature of the software could have fundamentally changed 100, 300 times uh, in, in those five days. Um, it, uh, I'm not saying I have the answers, I'm just saying these are some things we have to rethink uh, on how effective uh, um, uh, the way we're approaching risk in the software-defined world. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah well, I, I go out of here to say the software has disrupted our traditional subjective methods of identifying, measuring, and managing system risk. Um, new ways of thinking, right? So DevOps and DevSecOps is, is, should be the norm. It should, be the, it should be the way we're now by which we're working. It's slowly becoming that way, but, way, but it's gonna take more time before we get there. Uh, but this is a new way of working. Uh, security loves chaos engineering. There's a lot, of things we can, uh, a lot of things we can learn and utilize chaos engineering to improve and validate uh, um, how our security actually functions versus how we, it works in reality, I mean, versus how we think it works versus how it actually works in reality. And um, so with security chaos engineering, one of the things I use it for is to, um, it allows, instead of the post-mortem, instead of after, after the fact with events incident, try to figure out what happened through log data that you may or may not even have, or may or may not have ever been written, you can actually, um, you know, you can actually use the post-mortem as your pre preparation. What, I, what do I mean by that? So post-mortems are typically after the fact, after an incident or an outage, and you're doing, you get the team together, you try to figure out what happened, what was the root cause, which is also not a thing. Um, but uh, with chaos engineering, we're able to proactively inject failure and cause many, many incidents to, to understand how our system behaved during that behavior, um, how the system did. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about the use case of incident response in a second. Um, so I use, uh, I use a, a, a security chaos engineering at United to reduce uncertainty and build confidence in how the system actually functions. Um, uh, so who here is familiar with this story, Chaos Monkey? Okay, yeah. Uh, so raise them real high. Chaos Monkey. Who knows Chaos Monkey? Okay. Woo! All right. Who knows Chaos Engineering? And the number's always different. It's funny. Like, it's exactly the same thing. Um, so I'll try to tell you some things you don't know about Chaos Monkey. Okay? Um, so Chaos Monkey, for those of you who do or don't know, it, it, what it did was, uh, at the time, Netflix, so during Netflix's cloud transformation, Okay, a lot of people like to think chaos engineering is a super advanced thing. And we're not even doing DevOps. How are we going to do chaos engineering? Netflix wasn't advanced either. Okay, this is 2008. Netflix had made the decision to move from DVDs to da in, the, in the data center to Amazon. A feature of Amazon Web Services at the time is that uh, VMs would poof, or AMIs poof, randomly disappear. It was really it was a feature of AWS at the time. Um, and uh, so Netflix, uh, this is about the same time Reed Hastings came up with the culture memo saying he's, they're gonna hire the best people, no brilliant jerks, all that stuff, right? Um, well, what Chaos Monkey really did was, um, so during, during business hours, it would pseudo randomly bring down an AMI in, in a random service. What, what that really did was, it, 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 it put a well-defined problem in front of an engineer. Because you have to remember, Netflix has no chief architect, no way of mandating you must do things. So what it did was, it caused the problem. It made engineers aware of the fact that this could have caused, this could happen to my service or my, my system. I need to build my system to be resilient to this problem. So it put a well-defined problem in front of an engineer. And it turns out, engineers do well with, well, they, they solve well-defined problems pretty, pretty easily. Um, 
So uh, those are a few things about Chaos Monkey. So some of the security chaos engineering use cases, you can find more. Uh, there's a coming O'Reilly book. If anyone's interested, there's a sign up for the, that O'Reilly book for free if you want a copy of it uh, at the Verica booth in the, uh, in the, the sponsor hall. Uh, no strings attached. If you want the book, you can have it. But there's security, there's chapters in that go deeper in the steps and how to and all that stuff that I can't cover in this talk. Uh, some of the use cases I used it for were uh, to improve incident response, uh, to validate architecture uh, was, uh, was as effective as, as I had uh, provided. I used it to, to validate uh, security controls. I used it to improve security observability, determine how effective or how the quality of log, log events uh, um, during certain types of outages and incidents, uh, as well as we used to continuously verify um, uh, sort of a regression type testing after the experiment had been successful. Uh, it's also a great way. Uh, every chaos experiment has compliance value as well. Um, yeah, I got that earlier. So incident response. I got five minutes left, so I'm rolling through this. Um, so incident response. So um, let's see what we'll go through here. So um, so incident response. So uh, incidents. Uh, so incidents are somewhat subjective in nature. Uh, security incidents are. No matter how much money you spend, how much you prepare, you really don't know when it's, uh, who's attacking you, why they're doing it, when they're going to attack, how they're going to get in, um, you know, and how effective your technology is until it actually occurs, right? Uh, and um, you know, you're assuming that the event actually was not caused by a cascading failure. We typically never take that into account. Um, but anyway, um, so uh, at United Health Group, we used chaos engineering to validate run books that they're actually effective, that the technology's fired the way we thought they did. Uh, and that was really the value of, of it. It was really uh, determining what, one, if the things worked the way we thought it did, but two, if it, they did or didn't, what else worked? Uh, was, was the, did the log events make sense? If the log event doesn't make sense to a human, it's time to rewrite the log event. Um, I talked talk about that a little bit. Uh, I, I really used, it's really about creating objective feedback loops about how effective your security actually is. Um, so yeah, it's about, so um, I, I always try to prioritize like what I have the ability to control. I don't have the ability to control zero days and, and the, the dark web and what people are doing and, and, and exploit packs, but I do have the ability to control the quality of the logs. I do have the ability to control placement or instrument, increase instrumentation, increase Increase observability and awareness of what works, what doesn't. Those things I can do. I can't. I can't control what somebody else does. Um, so resilience also doesn't mean what you think it does. Uh, what do you think it means? Security people in security keep using the term incorrectly. Um, you know, resilience is not DR, disaster recovery or BCP. That is availability theater. Your system will almost never fail holistically for a hot site. I mean, yes, there are special circumstances with natural failures. But what about the gray failures? What about the way the system really fails uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, increases in, um, you know, uh, uh, traffic and sort of DDoSs, or you know, you DDoS yourself. Um, you know, you um, you know, you didn't val validate that your forensics actually functioned. Um, you know, or um, the gray failures. Uh, so the definition of modern resilience is the resilience is the ability of systems to prevent or adapt to changing conditions in order to maintain control over a system property, to ensure safety, and to avoid failure. This definition really comes from. Uh, being applied to nuclear nuclear systems and um, air, the airline industry and, and now um, retrofitted for software. Um, so yeah, failure is now the normal condition. How am I doing on time? I'm out. Okay. All right. All right. I'm trying to get, trying to get through it. All right. Um, uh, humans. Uh, it's, uh, it's important to remember that humans are not the problem. They're actually the solution. Uh, root causes also do not exist, uh, and I can explain why. So name, think about one root cause, one, one thing why you are a successful person or the company you work for is successful. The same reason why you can't come up for a root cause, why it's successful, is also the same reason why there really isn't one for why, what, what bad things that happen. If you end in root cause, uh, as your root cause being a cause by a human, that is the beginning of an investigation, not the end. What about all the humans' processes and technologies that led up to that event? That makes sense. Okay, one minute here. All right, uh, I highly recommend, and I'm telling you, anybody who follows through with this and actually reads it, uh, it's going to blow your mind. The field guide to human error investigations is written by Sidney Decker. It comes as a result of 30 years of doing investigations on pilot error, uh, and it will blow your mind. Uh, and there are so many lessons learned that we can learn in the way we do investigations, the way we do postmortems, the way we treat humans, the way the, the processes by which we approach compliance and, and engineering. Um, I believe this should be required reading for anyone in security. Um, so 
Yeah, I don't have time for that. <laughs> Automation is the magic answer. Um, last couple of things here. Last two things. Last two things. Um, so one of the other things I, I, I really try to preach at United Health Group, and because I, I only had, you know, United Health Group has 400 companies. I only had 130 architects that, that worked for me, right? How is it possible I can do everything, right? But like, I started thinking about value chain, right? Where does the how does the company generate and deliver value to customers, right? And I started asking people in security, do you know where you sit in the value chain? Do you, like, um, are you part of, how are you contributing, or where do you sit? And it's actually um, an interesting question. If you can't ascertain where you sit in the value chain, you re know, really need to be rethinking what you're doing, your role, your responsibilities. Um, so lastly, I'll leave it with, uh, with um, two things. Yeah, two things. Uh, everyone must code, right? Uh, that was actually taken by James. I actually said everyone should learn how to code, uh, but like it, 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 it's Python was originally conceived, uh, well, the ideas for Python were originally con uh, conceived uh, for children, right? That's why it's so easy to write. It's so easy, so easy to understand. Uh, you can, anyone in this room, whether you're in security, you've never been an engineer before, can learn Python in three hours, right? <coughs> it's easy to play, but hard to master, right? Uh, but uh, it's really about building empathy and understanding with engineering because this is what I want to leave you with is that we always like to say everyone is responsible for security but everyone is responsible for the engineering as well right like we we love to we love to point the finger that you're doing this you're not doing this right this is insecure like but what are you actually doing to Im to improve that to contribute back instead of pointing the finger at where a problem might be and that's that's the end so Thanks.